Wes, you've joined us. Hi, everybody. Yep, I'm going to hand my phone to Alicia. We're live, Wes. Put it in the drawer so it doesn't bother you. So let's not let anyone in yet. And Wes, so Wes, 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 we're live. Wes, we're live. Wes, what? We're, we're live. live. Say hello, oh, everyone. Hi. I'm lost. That's okay. Um, I'm going to jump in and say good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm the host this afternoon. My name is Katrina Hyam. I am the Head of Education and Training. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're going to start in just a few uh, minutes. Um, please jump on and make sure you say hi um, to all the panellists who I'll introduce in just a second. Um, and we'll start probably in about a minute. So stick around and uh, we'll be with you in just a second. Everyone's coming on, it's great. No, it's so awesome to see all those names pop up. Hi, Jackie. See everybody Amazing. pop in and say hi. Hi, Vanessa. <laughs> hi, hi. So while people are popping on, I'm just going to reintroduce myself. So my name is Katrina Hyam. I'm Head of Education and Training at Restaurant and Catering. Um, I'm also going to introduce you, um, starting from the top, we'll start with Wes Lambert, who is the CEO. Then we have Belinda Clark, who is the COO. Um, then we have Tom Green, who's Head of Policy and Governance. And we have Anthea Nomikos, um, who is the Membership Manager here in Victoria. So um, we're about to start. Um, we're going to start with Wes doing a overview. Um, and then we're going to move on um, to Tom to talk about uh, policy IR. Um, and then uh, we'll be managing the chat this afternoon as well. Um, Anthea and I will be looking after the chat. So please make sure you send them through. Um, we will do our best to answer as many questions um, as time permits live. Um, otherwise, we'll be sending through links um, for information throughout the session today as well. So please make sure um, that you're obviously sending those questions in. Um, and we'll start in probably a, about a minute. Uh, can you see the questions down the bottom popping up? Yeah, they're, pop they're popping up as well. Right. So I think right. we can start if that's okay. Um, Wes, would you like to start off doing a, uh, a bit of an overview of the situation at the moment, please? Absolutely. So Melbourne is now under stage four restrictions and regional areas will enter stage three restrictions from tonight, Wednesday, 11.50 p.m. Uh, Mitchell Shire, which entered stage three restrictions on, with Melbourne on a July, will, stay, will remain under the same conditions. From tonight at midnight, um, there will be three categories of businesses with specific conditions in place for each. A number of industries and sectors uh, will need to close for a six week period until 13 September. These conditions apply to metropolitan Melbourne only, okay? And our industry, restaurants, cafes, coffee shops, are in the open category. Uh, category two businesses will remain open for on-site work with COVID safe plans, uh, which uh, are available on our hub uh, under stage four restrictions. Th this category includes restaurants and cafes, which can provide deliver delivery and takeaway only, as well as roadhouses, which may offer dine-in in order to comply with national heavy vehicle regulations, excuse me. So again, as well as roadhouses, which may offer dine-in in order to comply with national heavy vehicle regulations. Category one businesses must close for on-site work. This includes pubs, bars, taverns, clubs, nightclubs, and food courts. So those category one businesses must be closed in total. Uh, there is no further um, information about those businesses uh, wanting to offer delivery. If you fall into those categories, you must close from tonight at midnight, okay, unless you need more time to close safely. Uh, under stage four restrictions, two venues, which are cafes and restaurants and coffee shops, uh, can continue to offer delivery and takeaway uh, as per stage three rules. However, 
between 8 p.m. and 5 a.m., customers cannot leave their homes to collect takeaway. So venues will be limited to delivery during these hours. And let me be clear, you do not want to be a business that is trying to take uh, customer orders at five minutes to 8 p.m. Uh, because you certainly will, will run afoul of uh, those customers either being in your venue after eight uh, or uh, contributing to those businesses, uh, those individuals breaching the curfew. So certainly when you're making your policies and procedures, ensure that you give your customers enough time to order and get their food so that they have time, sufficient time to uh, be in their homes by 8 p.m. Um, people must also remain within a five kilometer radius of their home, including when picking up takeaway and shopping in the grocery store. And each household is technically only allowed one trip to the shops each day. So it is not different. So we are considered to be shops. So if someone needs to go out to shop, they aren't allowed to go out in the morning and get their coffee, then their morning tea, then their lunch, then their afternoon tea, and then go to the grocery store to shop for an hour. That's not allowed. You're allowed out of your home for one hour a day to take care of everything that you need to do, both with restaurants and with grocery stores. Uh, staff, however, are allowed to travel more than five kilometers away from their home for work. Um, Adjacent industries are facing tougher restrictions, including meat processing and distribution centers. So the supply chains for your restaurants and cafes will be um, affected. So it's very important that you're working very closely with your suppliers uh, to ensure that you can get your, um, that you get the supply that you need. Uh, I did notice a question I'll answer quickly. Realize that, that, anyone who's outside of their home between 8 p.m. and 5 a.m. are working. So they are working. So you don't have to worry about them, especially if they don't work for you. Uh, but if they are your employees and they're working, they would have their exempt certificate on them and they would have the right to be outside of their house between 8 p.m. and 5 a.m., okay? So it's just, people are just not allowed to be away from their home for personal reasons past five kilometers. Um, meat works, which have been tied to a number of outbreaks, will be operating at two thirds uh, capacity and there'll be strict restrictions on abattoirs. Uh, and warehousing and distribution will also be restricted to two thirds capacity. Again, if you're going to be open for takeaway and delivery, you certainly need to be mindful of this when you're making your orders uh, for the next at least six weeks. Um, businesses that are remaining open have until 11.59 on Friday. 7 August to implement their COVID safe plan, which has just uh, been popped up in the chat. Uh, so it's very important that you have that uh, completed. Um, from 11.59 on Wednesday, all hospitality venues in regional Victoria can only operate for takeaway and delivery. This includes restaurants, cafes, pubs, and bars. Okay, so if you are in regional Victoria and you have any questions, uh, it includes restaurants, cafes, pubs, and bars. Uh, and you can only operate for takeaway and delivery. And I know it's been a long time since uh, you and regional Victoria have been under these tight restrictions, uh, but um, you, know, you certainly need to be thinking about how you would implement your delivery, uh, seeing as uh, the delivery apps, both self and large app, don't work as well in the regions. It's very important that you get your plan together now. Uh, all restrictions are in place until at least Sunday, 13 September for the whole state. Now those words at least were used uh, because no one knows what the outbreak is going to do in Victoria. It's not a hard day. On the spot fines of up to $1,652 for individuals and up to $9,913 to businesses will be issued for non-compliance. We have spoken to justice in Victoria. They will be issuing fines in almost every instance. So do not play the game of you don't think that you'll get caught you will get caught. Uh, this is the uh, stage where uh, the Victorian government is going to be heavy handed. Uh, the time for education is over. So please, please comply. Uh, good news, some good news is businesses that have been forced to close in Melbourne and Mitchell Shire can apply for grants up to $10,000 and regional businesses can apply up for $5,000 grants. This is in addition to what was there before. Uh, 
the government acknowledges that the uh, restrictions and their implementation is not perfect, uh, certainly has led to a lot of questions. Uh, so that is the, um, the overview. And we, I see that there's already a bazillion questions. So um, I'm going to hand this back over to Kat, who is, uh, who is hosting this meeting, to uh, continue with the agenda. Thank you. Um, so we might um, hold off a couple of the questions until the end. So Tom might actually cover quite a few of these as we're going through. Um, so I think we might move on to Tom um, to discuss IRM policy uh, and uh, take it away. Thanks, Tom. Hey, everyone. And look, thanks for having us. Um, obviously, this is going to be a particularly difficult time. I can only imagine how you are all feeling, how your staff are feeling and how six weeks might seem like a lifetime right now when you're looking at what is in front of you. Um, it's something that we think about quite a lot. Though some of us are based in New South Wales, we do feel the pain of our membership in whatever state they're in. I just wanna say that genuinely I'm feeling your pain and I hope that anything that I can do today to help you get through or help you get more clarity, I genuinely hope that we're able to kind of give you a little bit of, of clarity and certainty on at least on how the next six weeks are going to look for you and your businesses. Um, what I wanted to cover off in order kind of firstly was how we are expecting the rules to apply and, and what our advice is to your businesses in terms of where your priorities need to be, um, both strategically and also from a compliance perspective. Secondly, how you go about making sure that your staff are compliant in relation to the essential worker permits and what you'll need to do to understand how they operate with the different arms of your business, both the takeaway arm, which will be in-house and the delivery arm, which may be a combination of in-house and external using a provider. And thirdly, the interaction with the new mask requirement and how we are seeing those relevant exemptions play out. So firstly, and, and this is, this is more a point of advice in a general sense to members in terms of looking at how these rules apply. We've had a lot of um, kind of angst around the 8 p.m. curfew and a lot of questions around the 8 p.m. curfew and how that's designed to work. Um, obviously what it means in a strict sense, and I'm, I'm kind of painting a hypothetical here, is you, you and your business are perfectly entitled to remain open beyond 8 p.m. for takeaway but the reality is you will have no one walking into your restaurant or cafe after 8 p.m. because of the curfew arrangement. So one of the things, and this has been the advice that we've given to members who've called through already, has been your priority needs to be on the rules that affect your business and your focus needs to be on ensuring that you are complying with the rules that affect your business and to be less focused on the rules that might govern your customers. For example, you may not know whether the person that comes in to pick up takeaway tomorrow night, whether that's their third, fourth, fifth or sixth time out of their house for that day. That's not me saying that you should turn a blind eye to that, not at all. But your focus needs to be on ensuring that your business is complying with the rules and requirements that are in place around the way that your staff are meant to act, interact with customers through the use of masks and the, and the like and how your business interacts with curfews and worker permits and the like. So that's, that's more of a general point that I wanted to open up with because I think I've had a lot of questions about that and you will send yourself spare over a six week period trying to track all your customer's behavior and trying to enforce your customer's behavior. Obviously you want to set a standard, but you will go crazy if you try and be the police force over your customer base. Secondly, and this is probably the only, this is the silver lining of the cloud, so to speak. Um, there is going to be a much less competitive market for takeaway food over the next six weeks in broader Melbourne and Mitchell Shire. What we know is that around 40% of meals are eaten out of home. We saw that actually increase during the first kind of shutdown lockdown arrangement over March and April. Um, and what we've got out of this is a similar environment whereby it will actually be worse for, for a number of reasons. One, pubs and other hospitality venues, they're not allowed to open their restaurant. They're not allowed to open their food business. They are closed full stop. 
uh, they are genuinely treated differently to our sector. Um, and they have been told that they are not, they are, there's no exemptions, there's no exceptions in place, they are closed. That goes for clubs, pubs, and, and other kinds of hospitality venues. So what you have got when it comes to a kind of takeaway or third party food market are the supermarkets, your fast food chains, and cafes and restaurants. So there will be a market for customers to purchase, whether it's ready-made meals, whether it's coffees or takeaway, or whether it's um, you know entire meals at dinner time. There will still be demand for those types of products, if if not a lot more than what you would expect. And that's been our experience through the first phase, and that's I think going to be the outcome of this period here over the next six weeks. So that's that's the silver lining in the cloud that I wanted to give. Um, and I think that kind of lead, leads quite nicely to our next point, which is around, um, and it's a question that we've had asked almost perennially of us here, is how do I go about ensuring that my delivery partner, whoever they may be, is compliant under the, the, the permit worker scheme? And how do I make sure that my workers are compliant when it comes to the, to the permitted worker scheme? So the first point is, if your business is allowed to open in whatever form that that looks like, and you have people that you are employing, they are considered essential workers, which means that for them to be able to, they are able to carry out the operation of their job in a day-to-day -day basis in your business without that much impediment in terms of their interaction with the current rules. So that means, it, let's say you employ a driver in-house, they can deliver outside of that five kilometre radius from your business, that, that, that kilometre radius in terms of your business does not apply, but they can't be out and, and doing things whilst they're delivering that might be considered a personal nature and that's where they might run into a problem. So let's say they're driving and they go, oh, actually, I really need to duck into Woolies on my way back to, to the restaurant to pick up, you know, um, you know, some frozen food for tonight that is where they're going to run afoul because that's a personal use of their time. But simple things that you would expect them to be doing in the interaction of their duties, picking up stock and supplies, um, filling up the car with petrol, those kinds of things, that will be considered a part of their, their, their position in your business and that will be part of their essential work environment. So the most important thing is that you go through with each of your workers, you get them to fill out that form, you get it all signed, you get everyone in agreed with it and they carry it with them at all times. It doesn't have to be purely um, uh, hard copy. They don't have to carry around a piece of paper with them at all times. It can be an electronic form. We've had that confirmed, but it's important that they carry it in some way. So that's, that's a really important thing to note from the, um, from the permitted worker scheme. So our encouragement is that that's, that's the first compliance hurdle that you need to jump in your business is making sure that all of your staff internal to your business are compliant with that arrangement. Um, understanding that obviously there's been crashes today. The second thing relates to the delivery companies or those of you who might partner with a third party delivery company. And we've had this question so many times. And my advice to you is this, you can't control whether or not that delivery driver has properly gone through the permitted worker scheme. And it's actually not your responsibility to ensure that they have. That is actually a problem for the delivery companies to sort out. All of them are going through it because the reality is, and as we all know, those drivers often operate across multiple platforms. They're not just a menu log driver or a delivery driver or an Uber driver. They often mix across one, two or three. Um, so, but that is their responsibility to sort out who signs off their form and how they're allowed to do it. And are they contractors or are they employees of the business or anything like that? That is a problem that, that the delivery companies need to fix. It's not your concern. The only point that I would make as a point of best practice, it's not a requirement, but it's a point of best practice is if you want to record the names and details of drivers that do come through your business and at what point in time they come through your business. If that's a practical thing for you to do, that's something that you can do to give yourself that added level of safety. However, it's not a requirement at all. And it's not a requirement that you need to check their worker permit scheme. It's not a requirement that you need to ask them to show it to you or anything like that. Um, so you don't, you don't need to worry about that. If you are using your own staff, Yes, you will need to ensure that they have that worker permit system. 
you will need to ensure that let's say you have you one of your front of house staff that also double ups for deliveries you know and they or they will do that after 8 p.m to carry you through that last couple of hours they will have to have that worker permit scheme filled out the other interaction that we found with the worker permit scheme is in relation to rosters um, and in relation to being able to provide six weeks of rosters and, and there are some of our, there are some reasonable questions that are being asked about well, I don't provide six week rosters to anyone. I certainly don't want to provide six week rosters to my casuals because that's that 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 puts me in a from an IR perspective in a in a situation where I might be liable to pay for those shifts that I've rostered them on to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my advice is you want you need to be able to do your best. And it's it's about making your best efforts as a business to comply with these arrangements. Because the reality is, and this is where these systems have been rushed in, they haven't been fully thought through. And no government ever has had to think about a system like this. So they haven't necessarily thought through of all the interactions. And one of the key problems is on the IR space with having to fill in that roster. So my advice would be do the best that you can when it, terms, when it comes to filling out your individual staff's rosters. If it's not wholly and fully compliant, um, then, then you're gonna have to, uh, really the only option that you are left with is to do your best. Because if you're not in a position to be able to guarantee that worker's hours for the full six week period, you might be able to guarantee that they will only work, say, two days of a weekend every week, but you don't know what hours or whatever it is. It's about you as a business taking the best steps that you can until such time as more detail is provided from the government. And we do expect that for our sector in particular, that more detail will be provided on how businesses will go about ensuring that those workers are um, compliant with that rostering arrangements when it comes to the work, worker permit scheme. The final bit that I'll touch on, and I'm sure we'll have a lot more questions about the worker permit and I'll jump into those later, but the final point is about masks. Um, our reading of it when it comes to the interaction between the requirement for staff to wear masks and the workers' compensation, uh, and the work health and safety system is this. There's no argument for front of house staff to not be wearing masks. They, all front of house staff should be wearing masks. The only time that we could see a reasonable exemption in place for back of house staff would be if heat was a problem. So the example that we discussed in the office is if you've got a chef, uh, you know, flipping burgers, for example, who's sitting over a hot grill in a 45 degree kitchen and he looks like he's about to faint, that's, a, that's an example of where a, a reasonable exemption would be in place for masks. A second reasonable exemption would be where there's a visual blockage for what they're doing or whether or not the work that they're doing might reasonably cause them to injure themselves if they're not, if the mask was an impediment to that. The example that I use is, so I wear glasses. If my glasses are fog fogging up as I'm chopping onions out the back of the house, there is a very reasonable risk there that I'm going to cut myself because the mask is causing my glasses to fog up. That's a reasonable exemption where they would need to take that mask off. Um, or if you've got someone who's a kitchen hand, who's using the uh, industrial dishwasher and is changing plates and you've got the same problem where their glasses are fogging up and the, the mask is making it worse and there's a risk of them burning themselves on that, on that utensil, that's a reasonable exemption, but you need to use a common sense approach. And it's, not, it's never gonna be something where they say, right, chefs are exempt or kitchen hands are exempt. It's not gonna work like that. You're gonna need to be able to use common sense in your business, but, if you're unsure, if you've got a very specific example that you want to be able to talk through, give us a call. Um, we're here and we're available. We're more than happy to provide guidance in that regard. Um, I think that kind of covers everything. I'm happy to take a million questions, but I've tried to cover off on some of the key things from there. Thanks, Tom. Um, I think we might um, cover off a couple of the questions that have come through and then we'll um, uh, put it over to Anthea. I know she's got some questions from people that weren't able to attend today. Yep. So um, the first one is, is um, do delivery drivers need a log book as well as their permit? You know, they Not, know where they're going. Yeah, so this is, comes under, under a worker who is required to visit multiple sites. That's kind of, that, that's the, 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 the section. And delivery drivers for distribution companies, so your suppliers will have the similar situation. They'll need to keep the log books. It's their responsibility to keep the log books. It's not your responsibility to make sure they're filled in their log book. So the answer is yes, but it's not your problem. I, I, I'm sorry to be so blunt about it, but that's honestly, you've got bigger problems to worry about than whether or not each delivery rider that comes through your business is filling out their logbook. Um, that's honestly, if it's for them to sort out. So what if it's somebody that's a, an internal staff member? Absolutely. And they need to make sure that they are filling out that, that logbook as reasonably as possible. Um, if they want to go above and beyond, it would be also recording the locations of the deliveries as well. 
so they can actually show what houses they've been to or what deliveries they've fulfilled. That's that's going complete best practice, but that's honestly, that's that's the best thing that you could do. Amazing, thank you. Um, so the next question is, is that um, can you still travel from the Mornington Peninsula to Melbourne to pick up st uh, supplies for the cafe or restaurant? Yes, if there's no alternative for you to be able to procure those supplies. So you can travel for the purposes of your essential work, which obviously your cafe, let's say you're picking up coffee beans from a roaster in the CBD, as an example, um, yes, but you'd need to clearly state that in your work permit as to why you are traveling and where you are traveling and the purpose that you are traveling and the days that you have to go and do it. So if you wake up in the morning and realize you don't need to go and get more, fill out a work permit and make sure that it's reported. Because we don't, the reality is I don't know, we don't know yet, we haven't seen the compliance yet from Victoria Police. We don't know how strict they're gonna be. We don't know how they're gonna look at some of these kind of bits that fall through the cracks, which is a, a common result of these things being rushed out so quickly. So my advice is do your best, go above and beyond until we can gather some intelligence here to get an understanding of what the compliance approach is. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so one of the other ones that, that's just popped up as well is asking about rosters and if they do a blanket roster from 8 a.m. to 12 a.m. Um, over the five days, that leaves them room for the midweek last minute changes. Is that acceptable? Yes, but obviously when those last minute changes occur, they'll need to update the work permits according, accordingly to ensure that whatever the, the, whatever, the, whatever the police officer checks needs to be accurate as at that point in time. So suggesting a weekly, if they can, they obviously then do weekly um, permits at, at the time. Yes, but again, you'll still need to be looking ahead. So you'll still need to be able to, you'll still, you'll still be required to, to your best ability, reasonably um, uh, suggest when those people might, might need to be leaving their homes. Because you've got to think of it from a different perspective, right? Um, let's say you've got a chef that travels from one location to another, every Tuesday afternoon for work. But then there's one day where he actually isn't rostered on for Tuesday, but they find him traveling into the city anyway, that he'll actually slip through the cracks there when that individual should act, should not actually be leaving, um, be, be traveling outside of that five kilometer radius for that purpose. So that's why they're asking you to, you to the best of your ability to comply. So then they know that when someone look, gets that work permit open, they look at it, it's accurate as at that point in time. And that's the most important thing. Right. If, you know, um, if it's not perfect six weeks from now, it's very unlikely that they're going to be very fussed about that. What they are going to be pretty worried about is if people are carrying around work permits that are not accurate as at that point in time. Okay. So the message is continually updating them, making sure that they're as close to uh, reasonable as possible um, over the next six weeks. Yes. Right. So um, VCGLR, um, yes. if you can take away licenses um, for alcohol uh, for free some months ago, they expire next month. Is restaurant and catering uh, discussing extensions on this? Absolutely. We wrote to the Minister for Liquor and Gaming in Victoria late last week to request a meeting with them to push for a further extension of this program. We think it's something that's broadly happened across various states and territories. I think every single state and territory has done it in some form with a few kind of minor details that have been amended. So, you know, a, pack, a six pack of beer might be two six packs or might be something different. Um, our view is that it's, a really, it's been a really, really um, important lifesaver for a lot of businesses to come through. Um, and we think that there's a really good argument for it to be extended and we'll be continuing to push that in Victoria, noting that Victoria is actually the state with the most progressive set of liquor licensing arrangements. Um, so you guys already have the special amendment that allows on-premise licensees to sell a limited quantity of, quantity of takeaway alcohol that exists under your current liquor licensing structure. In every other state and territory in Australia, there's nothing like that. So you guys are actually best placed compared to the rest. But again, we're pushing that nationally because we believe that there's an argument nationally for that to continue. So um, the last question before I hand it over to Anthea, and one of the other questions um, again is about these rosters and um, two weeks in advance. So would you recommend them populating it two weeks in advance or would you recommend them holding off until absolute last? Um, how, would you, how would you recommend it for two weeks in advance worth of rosters? Yeah, so if you've got a, um, if you have got a 
weekly roster schedule, for example, I'd be issuing new work permits weekly. That would just be my advice, just from a logistical perspective, um, because then you know that everything you're putting in place is correct. But what you also need to be doing is estimating to your best ability out for those full six weeks as listed in the roster when those staff are required to work. But then at the beginning of each week, you then update the roster so you know that the week that you're in is 100% correct as per the roster that you've issued. Now, again, that, that's about best, best efforts to comply because, again, it's where the police are going are to be focusing. They're not going to be saying, oh, well, you know, are you rostered on, on the 11th of September at 11 a.m. to travel from X to Y? They're not going to be fussed about that. They're going to be fussed about where are you right now and what are you doing right now and do you have a work permit that permits you to do that? That's, so that's what you've got to try and guard against. And what would you do if you were the owner and the director and working in the business? Would you sign your own permit? What would you recommend? Yes. No, no, no. In, in that situation, you would sign your own permit as you are, you would be considered like you would be looked at in the same way that a, 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 an individual contractor would be looked at in the same way that you can sign your own form because you're working for yourself in that, in that sense. Like it's, it's a bit messy because you might not be taking a wage, et cetera, but that's generally how it would work. Just keep, a business code, just keep a business card with you and that will alleviate any concerns. If you have a form and you're the owner of the business and you have a business card that says owner, proprietor, CEO, or otherwise, uh, really it's going to be about common sense with the authorities. Great. Thank you. Um, Andy, would you like to go through a couple of your questions for Tom? Sure. I think a lot of them have been covered. I have got a couple of other bits and pieces here. Most were about last minute roster changes. There was one, there's a little bit of information on the site which has caused a bit of confusion and that was the statement on there, unless an exemption applies, ensure that workers do not work across multiple sites or for multiple employers. So a lot of people are confused. Obviously they employ a lot of casuals, they may work at another for another employer and they are coming to me and saying, do they have to choose one employer to work for over this uh, lockdown period. So, um, Tom, can you provide a bit more clarity on that? That's, look, that's a good question. And again, this is an example of this thing being rushed out very quickly and they're not thinking through the detail of these things, um, especially where you might have a chain store. Like, we have this problem, you think about McDonald's having this problem, where you might have one staff member working across six different restaurants, you have a huge problem. Um, we don't have clarity on this yet, but the moment that we do, we'll be able to provide that to members. Um, the expectation yeah. is that, let's say that your casual employee works at business A, Monday to Wednesday, and your employee works at business, business B, Thursday and Friday, uh, that um, the, the expectation is that it will be uh, multiple permits, meaning one permit from one employer mm -hmm. and one permit from another. That's the expectation, because that makes common sense. As yep. Tom said before, where are you right now? Are you supposed to be working? Uh, are you supposed to be out? Mm. out? Yep. Exactly. Uh, another question I had. Um, a lot of venues said, are my admin staff permitted, or are they classified as essential workers? Obviously, people that do payroll, etc. they don't have a cloud-based system, they may need to go into the venue to do their work. Um, are they, they I'm assuming, or well, I would imagine that they are classed as essential workers within. Yes, the but they need to be. But they need to be clear as to why they're in that business, and that work permit yeah. would need to detail the fact that they cannot do this offsite. Because yes. so, the market. overwhelming working from home, the, over, the overwhelming working from home arrangement still sits from stage three, which is you must be working from home unless you physically yeah. cannot. So if you normally work in the head office of your restaurant group, your head office is not a restaurant. Yep. Hang on a minute. Sorry about that. Um, I think we've covered from all the bits that I had here that I had chatted to members about. I think that covers everything. The main things were the issues with the last minute roster changes, uh, whether paper or electronic uh, permits were sufficient. Also, regarding signatures, there were a few questions about signatures. Um, printed is fine. Yeah, printed. It doesn't physically have to be a signature. It needs to, it, it, a printed um, version of that is, is okay. If they print and sign, or if they've got, if you're able to do 
an electronic, if you're digital signature, but not everyone it, has. Look, it. even if it's a Word document, even if you print your name on there, mm -hmm. that that will be okay. But again, it, it's it's going to be about whether or not it's actually accurate or not, because it's it is a declaration. There, there's no magic thing that says yeah. writing it with a pen makes it a signature versus something else. Um, but but the problem is is that you know that those can't be false records or you know yeah. the, the reality is it's more likely going to be the, the case that employees are going to fabricate a working a working permit and they can show it. So my advice would be to sign them because it's simpler and it's harder yeah. to forge. Because what you don't want is an employee of yours, especially say a casual, not that anyone would want to do this, but let's let's be honest, there's a risk. Yeah. And a casual employee that doesn't work Tuesdays, you know, knocking up a second permit for themselves to wander off on Tuesday, them getting pinged. And the reality is it's going to be your business name on the permit. Another question that keeps getting asked uh, that uh, we're going to answer again. Um, the stage four restrictions as published by the Victorian government um, say that, uh, that as far as retail trade goes, um, only supermarkets, grocery stores, including all food and liquor shops. So a bottle shop that is known as a bottle shop can be open. And for accommodation and food service, if your business is, has traditionally been, is classed as, or has a license as a pub, tavern, bar, club, nightclub, or food court, you cannot be open for any reason. And, you know, we're, we didn't make this list. We don't, we don't, um, we don't have an opinion about it. This is an informational uh, webinar. And so if your business falls into that license type or that is how you operate, uh, then this, uh, the stage four restrictions uh, have precedent. And we certainly can ask some questions on your behalf. However, as of right now, um, that is the that is the firm view of the government. Thank you, Wes. Um, there is um, uh, the last question I, I've got on my list today is: Can you act on behalf of members to approach the government to change this? So, time that question. Sorry, is this in relation to the to the liquor to licensing bars. arrangement or to, bar, to bars that um, are asking? So, for example, if you have a cafe that is a cafe licensed as a cafe that happens to have a liquor license, you are allowed to deliver alcohol. Yeah. But if you are a bar, you must be closed. Yep. So that that's the comparison. Is it? I think it's an unfairness comparison, if I'm not um, mistaken. No, 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 absolutely. And look, I think that's a reasonable point. I think. Um, as I mentioned, I, I don't want to say that there'll be relaxations, but I think what they'll do is they'll realise that some of the laws that they've, you know, cooked up in four days maybe have some contradictions to them. Um, and in the same way, I I'm, I'm don't think this would be um, surprising to say that I think the clubs and hotels would be pretty annoyed that they're not allowed to open their restaurant for takeaway and delivery in the same way that restaurants will. So you'll have those kind of similar things evolve, but absolutely we'll, we'll, we're more than happy to take that up. Um, we speak with um, the premier's office quite, quite um, routinely um, or almost every day. And um, yeah, happy to, happy to raise that question. I think it's an important one. So thanks Paul. I appreciate you bringing that to my attention. Um, can you confirm that they need to establish a COVID safe plan for their cafe as per the template or can they create their own? I'd use the template. And why is that? Just because that's the form that any compliance officers are used to seeing. And if you give them a document that looks markedly different, then they're going to scrutinise it a lot more closely. That's, that's the God's honest answer. Yep, and we've been putting the link um, to the COVID Safe Plan Victoria um, throughout the conversation as well. Yep. Um, on there is some guidelines, obviously the template. There's a lot of FAQs um, sitting on there as well. Um, it gives you obviously um, quite a lot of detail about it. Um, and you can also find that um, on our COVID hub. Uh, and there's a whole heap of information, including all the templates that you can download straight from the hub. Um, I did see somebody before asking about a logbook template. Um, we'll put something up very shortly. Um, that is a generic one that you'll be able to print down. It's just an Excel spreadsheet. Um, then you'll be able to uh, customise it to your own needs. So um, that'll be up within the next half an hour.
Can I just add one more point from Eva's question? I'm sorry, I'm just reading the chat here in relation to multiple work sites. So where we want to get a an understanding of is multiple work sites within a single business versus multiple work sites across multiple businesses. Our view is that workers who are working for an individual um, business that might have, say, two cafes or two restaurant locations, they're allowed to do that across those multiple work sites. Where you've got multiple workers across multiple businesses, I think it's gonna be a harder thing for us to push, but we're certainly gonna ask that question as well, um, especially around where you've got, say, two casuals, like a barista that works, you know, alternate days across two businesses. And can you just reiterate for us, um, please, Tom, if um, somebody finishes their shift at eight o'clock um, at night and they've got a letter from the employer, they've got everything, um, are they allowed to travel home after eight o'clock? Yes. Right. Thank yes, you. they are. But they can't get out of their car and do other things <laughs> for, for personal reasons. No, they well, are, it, is a, it is a beeline, like they are, you know, essentially teleporting themselves home and to know other things, right. you know. So the good thing is that restaurants for, for takeaway during curfew hours and delivery outside, or takeaway and delivery during and delivery outside, we are an essential business. We are as essential as health. We are as essential as grocery. We are as essential, we are food service. We are feeding Victorians. And so when you think about uh, what applies to those other uh, essential industries, uh, certainly, there'll be lots of people that work at a grocery store that are rostered to receive deliveries at two in the morning um, off of the truck who finish at three in the morning. They'll also be during the curfew time. So uh, ultimately, begin to think of your business as essential and that um, logistics uh, to get businesses stocked up is also essential. Health is essential. Uh, and so th that's kind of the questions. No one's going to be uh, looking to call your employees out or to um, to affect your employees uh, for performing this essential service to keep Victorians fed through this crisis. So uh, one of the comments that's just come up as well is um, how do we ensure contactless delivery? And when people are delivering, um, they're talking about PPE and uh, what is recommended for delivery. So um, Tom, would you like to take this question? Yep. So the delivery guys should be wearing PPE. That's everyone should be wearing a mask full stop. There's no reason for them not to. Um, that mask needs to be provided by the individual as they are sole contractors. They're not employees of a wider organization unless they are. Um, so, you know, your suppliers as a different to say a delivery rider um, and should that person not be wearing PPE, that would be a concern cause for concern in your business and you'd be more than um well yeah you, you should be contacting the delivery company to let them know that you know rider x wasn't wearing a wasn't wearing a mask and we've we've certainly taken that question to a few of the delivery companies to say you know this is something that they need to make sure occurs and they're obviously educating their their riders appropriately um yeah i, th I think that kind of covers it yeah, great. Um, so uh, obviously there are apprentices um, still working at the moment and some of them uh, aren't able to drive. Um, what about parents driving apprentices or trainees um, to work and dropping them off? This is a really good question and it's one that I don't, don't have an answer to at the moment, but I will take it on notice. Great, thank you. Um, so we've covered off um, uh, about rosters. Um, somebody else is again covering off the, the six weeks. Would you mind going through the six weeks and um, can they amend the rosters as they're going through over the next six week period? Can you touch Absolutely. Absolutely. Like my, if you want my like, how do you do this in a way that's not going to make you completely mental, but also means that you're going to comply. Whenever you write your rosters, if it's weekly or, or fortnightly, but let's say it's weekly, you set in place a new work permit for that week and you write new work permits for everyone to fill in at the beginning of the week, which is a new permit that runs for that week. And then for the next five weeks or four weeks or three weeks as you go through, you just estimate out to the best of your ability, whatever it is. And eventually as that time kind of runs through, you'll add that, that kind of coming week will then become the current week and you'll adjust accordingly. Again, uh, it's, it's difficult to give what really, really kind of rock solid advice on this because it's happened so quickly. But th this is why I kind of my, my approach has been these permits are about being able to show police or show compliance officers 
that your staff are where they are supposed to be at the point in time that they are asked to provide that permit. So really what is the most important thing is that at that point in time, that work permit is correct. It's very unlikely that in five, that, that the police officer is going to go, well, where are you going to be in five weeks time? And you know, what, what business are you going to be working for and where are you going to be? Because that's not where they're inspecting you. They're going to be inspecting your workers and your staff and everyone else at the point in time that they walk into the business or stop them on the street or whatever it is. That's where, how it needs, and that needs to be correct for that point in time. So Kat, uh, uh, a anonymous attendee, and then Cheryl has put up that yes, a, par a parent, an adult can take an essential worker to and from work uh, without a work permit. However, the worker must have the permit. Great, thank you. Um, I'll make sure to share that in just a second as well. Um, so somebody's just come in and, and asked about masks. And if they're coming to work, um, does the employee need to supply the mask or the employer? Yeah, so this is a really, this is a great, oh, we've, had a, like, we've had a lot of these questions as well. When working in the business, the employer must make masks available for their staff to wear as part of the mandatory requirements. When they leave that store, a new compliance requirement comes into place for the individual that they must be wearing a mask at all times. So if your staff want to use their masks that they bring to work, then welcome to do that. But you still need to have a supply of masks on hand for your staff to use. That is your, in the same way that you would supply gloves to your staff in the back of house when they're working, you need to supply masks and you need to think of it that way. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, there are no more questions coming through at the moment that we sort of had a bit of a flood of questions. Um, and I think that we've uh, answered everybody's that we can um, today. If there's anybody else that wants to jump on and um, obviously call restaurant and catering, um, you can come and speak to us. Um, obviously sending us an email, um, calling the 1300 number, sending an email through, um, asking us jump on the coronavirus hub. Um, if you need any more information, there is a lot of downloads um, on that information on the Corona Hub, as I said before, um, and someone did post up before. There is a logbook uh, on the Business Victoria website. Uh, we will also link to that as well as the, the customised one that we can put up that you can do whatever you need to do to get the right information into your business. Um, so I think that's it for, for us. If there's no more open questions, um, thank you, Wes, Tom, Belinda, um, and Anthea um, for obviously being on here today. And thank you, everybody, uh, for coming along and listening. Um, and we will be keeping you up to date as quickly um, and as efficiently as possible. So great. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Bye.